And we're back with TSPN. I'm Supervisor Richard Forrester again, and we have with us Aaron Bruce Torrey. Aaron, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Oh, you're good. A former mayor of Amador City, but um, now you, and you had a former uh, job outside of the county with a, um, with a private firm that was an engineering firm? That's correct. I previously was doing consulting engineering, designing uh, both public and private improvements. Uh, one of my local projects was the Sutter Hill Transit Center, which I thought okay. turned out really well. Okay. What was your um, years of service outside the county at the private level? Uh, Ten years. Okay. So you got uh, a good amount of time out there where you were able to engage with the, the private sector and work with the public sector. So you kind of know how it works and where some of the pitfalls are. Yeah, absolutely. I had a stint in there doing a lot of uh, heavy civil construction, too, which... Uh, because I'm comfortable around the equipment, getting things done, maintaining roads, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's been brought up uh, in the community by a couple of people that, uh, why did we hire you? Why did we need a community development mm -hmm. director? Um, as I recall, um, the board looked at this as a very cost-effective measure because basically you were taking the, the position of three people that were formerly hired to do the job. So uh, we have three people now that aren't working for the county and uh, one of you. So I think there's a sufficient cost savings there. You have an engineering background versus uh, some of the people that uh, worked for the county before. They were good employees, but um, uh, most of them retired, and uh, we consolidated and, and downsized, and I think that was a good move for the county. I don't expect you to say yeah. that's good, but <laughs> anyway, that's from the county side. Um, let's talk about some of the revisions you're making in the department to make it easier for people. All right. I've been on about two years, just about a month over two years now. Doesn't, um, seem, doesn't seem like it. It goes by really, really fast. Lots yeah. changed in that amount of time personally and uh, professionally here at the, the county. Uh, one of the things we've uh, got accomplished in the public works or the uh, public works arena is a revision to the grading ordinance. Previously, mm -hmm. any grading that a person would do over 50 cubic yards required a permit. Mm -hmm. Uh, we took a good look at that and we increased that to 500 cubic yards. So now a person can go and uh, do grading on their property uh, up to 500 cubic yards, which is quite a bit. We have a couple restrictions on that. We want you to let us know mm -hmm. so that way we know that there's activity going on out there. Uh, we want to make sure you're not disrupting any uh, natural drainage features or placing any fills that may impact your neighbors. So we want to do a, a very cursory review of what's going on, but we want people to have the ability to do the things that they want to do with their property. And that's uh, come direction from the board and then staff has worked uh, to implement that. And so if you're going to impact drainages or things like that, you probably need to let the county know, though. Absolutely. You know, you, you can do those things. They just need to be reviewed, and it puts it to a higher level of scrutiny because there could be downstream effects as a result of that. Do the timelines still apply when you can do grading and when you cannot? I think you have to button up by, what, the end of October? October 15th is when all your erosion control measures need to be in place. Uh, so you, we call it the grading season is between April 15th and October 15th. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to do an exempt grading, which is up to 500 yards, the, the new policy that we established, uh, you're, you're supposed to do your grading bef between April 15th and October 15th. Okay. And that, that's a pretty substantial increase, 10 times the amount. Makes it a lot easier for people, and I'm sure you've had good comments out there. I've had some good comments, and, you know, we haven't had to do any code enforcement yet on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I'd say the program is, being, is successful right now. Good. Um, Let's talk about another uh, area where you're making improvements within the building department itself for over-the-counter plan review. Yeah, that's uh, a recent policy decision. Uh, talking with some of the contractors in the community and uh, different plan preparers, uh, trying to find a way to get small projects through the system a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a first-in, first-out policy, which has its merits. But sometimes, you know, someone have a deck that would be behind a, a large house or a commercial building that was getting a, a significant plan check. So mm -hmm. now a person with a small project can bring their application in on a Wednesday between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m., and they can get an over-the-counter uh, approval. Mm -hmm. They have to make sure they're, they're, all their documents are in order and everything's complete in order to facilitate that. But we have time set aside for our uh, plan checker to do that. Good. And so right at the counter, he'll take the plans and give them a quick review. Quick but uh, thorough, I would a imagine. quick but thorough, yeah. The, we pared it down to, you know, garages, mi minimum amounts of electrical and plumbing, uh, engineered retaining walls, uh, structures that generally conform to uh, conventional construction. Uh, things like that are a, fairly simple. Like square footage. If, if somebody's doing a 500-foot uh, addition to their house, would that 
fall under this, or is that a little uh, bit too well, big? You, you had, you, you'd want to define it a little bit more. Simple addition, if it's a bedroom, yeah, that would fall under this category. Okay. Minor electrical, minor plumbing. A kitchen, probably one. There's a lot more detail. There's a uh, lot of plumbing, and there's a lot of electrical that uh, go into A deck, a, a roof, something like that? That's correct, yeah. Okay. So simple, but uh, things that people want to get done and, and get moving. That's correct. I, I know in the fall, when it looks like rain, that's when they really want it done. So. Yeah. So this will really come in handy. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the, the road crew? What's going on there? You know, we're... Uh, the road crew's doing pretty well. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a lot of good people to work with up there. Uh, since I came on board, we're trying to institute some different changes in the way we keep track of the work that we're doing so that we can go back on an annual basis and uh, have a little bit better measures of what we got accomplished by road. Uh, the, uh, the folks on the road crew can have accounting of you know, what equipment they were operating so that they can tell that you know, they're getting the experience they need to advance in their careers. So I think that's a, a, a plus for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I had staff helping me with that, uh, all the way from accounting down to the guys on the road crew and the, the leadership on the road crew out there. I see a lot of commendations come <clears throat> through from people regarding the road crew, whether it's uh, snow plowing or whether it's road improvements that have been made. So people, I, I believe, are happy out there. What about the response time? If somebody calls up and says, I got a really bad portion of road here, that um, everybody that goes through it, they're swerving to get around it. I mean, what, what kind of response do they get? You know, usually we make a service request when something like that comes up, and we'll either send, depending on the uh, severity of it, uh, if it's something that's dangerous, we'll send someone out there immediately to get it taken care of. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, we generate a service request. We send an inspector or uh, someone from the road crew out there to take a look at it, quantify the work that needs to get done, and then we'll schedule it. Uh, we try to get the service requests done in a timely fashion uh, without interrupting our regularly scheduled work. But, you know, we're re routinely getting uh, phone calls. You know, someone sees a tree that's precariously hanging somewhere. We'll go out there and address it. Uh, it's great to have the eyes out there from the community letting us know what's up because we've got a lot of roads. We've got about 400 miles of roads that we have to maintain. Mm -hmm. And, and having not, those extra eyes out there helps us out. And not a lot of money. And not a lot of money. That's correct. So you've got to spread it pretty thin, but uh, go where it really needs to be done. That's correct. Uh, the Waste Management Department, I know we just uh, went through a process with ACES on, on looking at rates. So um, what's going on there? How effectively is it working the new rate structure? I think the new rate structure is working pretty well. We've been working on it since 2008. Uh, it's called the Rate Adjustment Methodology, the, the RAM. And we go through routine years where we change rates based on uh, five specific indices. And we're in one of those rate years this year. And right now we're projected to have... Uh, several rate decreases for the customers out there in areas one, two, and three, and I believe the Buena Vista transfer system. That's right. So almost so, the whole system. Almost the whole system. And I, you know, I, th I think that's great. It shows to me that the system's working there. We've got uh, our waste management department, Jim McCargue, is keeping a good eye on that and making sure that things are going the way we had planned it back in 2008 and bringing it forward, and I believe the, pl the system's working. You know, um, I, I think, too, the one thing I see in my notes that, that you put down is building confidence within the rate structure so that people know that it's working. And, and you know, the, that's, we're not saying they're not going to get rate increases down the road, but at least um, I can't recall in the past uh, maybe one or two times where you actually got a rate decrease. That's correct. I think uh, we, we've had one rate decrease, and that was at the end of 2012. And um, that wasn't for the whole district wide. But yeah, confidence in the system is important. And measuring it, making sure that we're being accountable, we're, we're checking the accounting records to make sure all these things are good, that goes a long ways. Again, when there's a, a rate decrease due, we're, we're looking at that. Uh, the department is taking a look at that and making those recommendations to the board to implement things like that. What is accounted for within the, the rate adjustment methodology? What factors are in there? In the factors in the rate adjustment methodology are diesel. There's a diesel fuel index. There's a labor index. There's a uh, vehicle depreciation index. There's a vehicle maintenance index. And then there's an, I believe it's called an other index, which brings a whole lot of other uh, items together. Did you cover labor in there too? Yeah, so? I did cover labor. Okay. That's correct. So those are the big items that cost the company a lot of money. And uh, the people, everybody has to pay the price of fuel. And uh, it, it's been going up. Well, it goes up and down, but that's why it's hard to. Well, that's why we tie it to, to the that. index, because that tries to normalize it a little bit, make mm -hmm. it a little bit easier to, to manage. So it's not as big as swings. And we started this a couple of years ago, I think, how many years ago now? Like four years ago? Because um, we just got tired of, of uh, picking numbers out of thin air 
Mm -hmm. We wanted something that was reliable, and as you said, something that the customers would look at as reliable. You know, the customers can go and look at the audits. I mean, we have audits done on this stuff. There's a paper trail describing everything that we're going through here. It's, it's very detailed, but the information is out there. We're going to run out of time pretty quick. I don't want to leave out Amateur City. There's a oh, new hey. new bridge replacement going on there. You're a city councilman there, so Absolutely. you got a lot city, of interest. City councilman for Amateur City, and I just uh, want to let everybody know our, our bridge construction is finally moving forward. It should be advertised uh, this week. And uh, our merchants are taking a proactive uh, position in that replacement. They're going to be hosting dances in the streets, dancing in the streets events on Saturday nights this summer to get people to keep coming to our city and uh, having a good time. And Michael Vasquez says he's going to do some, one of his famous duck feeds one night, huh? There's a barbecue for duck one night. That's correct. goes along with the dance. Now, um, this will go on the whole summer, or how, what's the time it's, frame? It's an 18-week construction schedule, and we should be in construction sometime mid-July, early to mid-July. So the advertisement is out right now, and does the county have anything to do with that? The county does not have anything to do with that. So this is all Amateur City? This is all Amateur City. We're utilizing ACTC's facilities to hold, host, uh, uh, to give out plans to prospective uh, contractors. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Amateur City is doing this project on their own. And who was the one that thought up the dancing in the streets idea? That's a good idea. That was a great idea. I, I want to give that credit to uh, Marianne McCammon of the Imperial Hotel. All right. I believe she was the uh, one who came up with the initial idea. She's the one that's moving it forward right now. So uh, as of uh, the start of this project, which will be mid-July, you said? Yeah. Uh, you will not be able to drive through Amateur City. Can you get around it? That's a good. That's a good question. Yeah, the not the first part. Of, not mid July, the road won't be closed. But shortly thereafter, when the contractor gets to the point where they're removing the old bridge, mm -hmm. the road will be closed down. Uh, there'll be a detour off of Water Street, so you can get around without being through a signalized intersection, and it could take some time. Uh, we want to make sure tourists and people can get through there. But uh, yeah, plan for a little bit of a delay or to go around. I think like your uh, big wheel contest that you have down there, if you build ramps on both sides, you could have a Dukes of the Hazard jump contest. You might have a dare daredevil contest. Yeah. Well, um, we're about out of time. Anything else you got from, uh, from the Community Development Department? I think I'm good. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a, a lot of responsibility there. The, the different areas you cover are uh, public works, land use, building department, code enforcement, environmental health. Did I miss anything? Road crews. Road crew. Yep. So big responsibility there. And uh, Aaron, you're doing a good job there in uh, appreciate that, two man. years. And hopefully I'll be on a couple more. Cool. You're still young. Thank All you. right. Thank you for being here. Thanks. All right. Um, we thank you for joining us on TSPN. I do. And uh, a Board of Supervisors meeting on uh, the 28th of May and 9 o'clock in the morning. And uh, this is Supervisor Richard Forrester. Uh, I'll see you at that point. You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN.